It is Wednesday afternoon, November 16th. We will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 14. We'll start verse by verse, word by word in verse 5. But just as a quick review, we've got our first war in Scripture. We saw last week, it's very interesting that the first recorded war and the last recorded war in Scripture are both in the same location. Found that interesting. We have four um, invading kings. Remember, a king was anybody <coughs> over a city in those days, more like what we call a mayor today. Some had more power, some had bigger cities, some had a couple cities together that they were over that would make them like a greater king. But it's not king over a, a whole empire, it would be king over a city even. Um, we saw in verse 1, Shinar was located north of the uh, end of Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates, Babylon, that area. We saw some of the names like Arioch, the servant of the moon god. So we see the area and we see that they're not worshippers of the one true and living god. Um, we move on down to the king of Goyim. Goyim is the Hebrew word for nations, for the Gentiles. Uh, so that could have been a title, still believed to be the Babylonian area, but it would have been one who had maybe city-states that were under him a little more powerful. We saw at this time those city-states and those kings that we're talking about, um, military service for them was common. You were pretty much inscripted into their service, and even though they were small, they were very fierce, they were very cruel. Um, they may have come down for this battle, for the uh, metal deposits that are in the region that are going to come into what we know is the land of Israel today. They're going to come in near the Dead Sea and, and that area. We'll talk about it. Um, Archaeology proves all this too, by the way, that these were actually cities and they were developed cities uh, during this time period. But uh, verse 4, I think it was, tells us they rebelled. Yes. There were these that were under, um, okay, it's a little easier to say in the Hebrew, believe it or not, Kedorla Amor, Lemur. No, now I can't do it my Hebrew either. <laughs> you say Chedorla Amor, and I'll say Kedorla Amor, Omer. We count the Omer, that's why if I can think, then I can say it right. I'll get my <laughs> tongue untwisted. But anyway, they're going to rebel, that for a time they were under his authority, he seemed to be one that had more authority, but we see that they rebelled, and that's the reason for this war. There's five who are going to be conquered by four. Four are going to, to come against those five, but we see from the line, as we looked at it last time in verse 4, that Noah's prophecy from chapter 9 and verse 26 is beginning to be fulfilled. Because Sodom was descended from Ham, from Ham, from the generation that produced the Canaanites, the Canaanites, and they were the cursed line. They would be subservient to Shem, the line that was the godly line, and Elam is from that godly line, and uh, Kedorla Amor, Amir, is the one who was from Shem's line. So we see that already playing out. Now as we pick up in verse 5, we're going to see the battle is going on at this point. In the 14th year, Kedorla Mer and the kings that were with him came and defeated the Raphim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Amim in Shavad Kiryadim, and the Horites. Well, that's verse 6. I'm, I'll keep struggling through names as we go, but let me back up and tell you these came from the Persian area. Um, We'll call him, I want to get a, a nickname, let's call him for short, Kador, okay? <laughs> That'll make it easier. It looks like C-H in your Bibles, but we'll call him Kador. He came with the kings that reunited with him to fight the five that he conquered earlier. Now they're rebelling against him. His, this again, Kedor Lamur is the king of Elam. He's the head of the Persian Gulf area. They've come down from the Mesopotamia area and they've gone down into what's Israel today, the Jordan, uh, the eastern side where the, the kingdom of Jordan is today, that they've come down through all of there. The Raphim, they were believed to be a people of large stature, and they lived in Bashan, that was east of the Jordan River. So if you remember the map, and if I do you a map simply with the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, when we're talking east, we're talking going toward Iraq, toward 
uh, Mesopotamia, the Persian area. Okay, that might make it a little easier to picture. So the people that lived near the Jordan River in the area called Jordan today were the ones called Raphaim. Again, believed to be large people. Um, and they lived all the way up north where Dan finally has his tribal area down toward the Sea of Galilee. So the northern uh, map of Israel, if you followed up from the, the Sea of Galilee and just moved over to your right, that's the area we're talking about. Ashtaroth, Karnaim, according to archaeologists, there were two adjacent sites, southern, e uh, sorry, southern Syria and east of the Sea of Galilee. So you've got the first group here, and you've got the second group like right here. You've got the what would be um, down here is Sea Galilee, but if we kept going north, what we see in Israel. So these two are right there real close. They were named for the moon goddess. That's what their name means. The Zuzim were probably the Zuzim, <coughs> Zoom Zooming. Boy, these are tongue twisters. <laughs> they were probably that group. We read about them in Deuteronomy. Let's run over there so that we see. And okay, okay. Once again, there we go. Okay, we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter two. I think it was yes, Deuteronomy chapter two. Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter two and verse 8, and then we'll drop down to 20 and 21. Verse 8 says, So we passed beyond our brothers, the sons of Esau, who lived in Seir, away from the Arba road, away from Elot, and at San Geber, and we turned and passed through by way of the wilderness of Moab. That's all a little down south of the area that we're talking about, but it's over on that side. When we come to verses 20 and 21, we read there, it's also regarded as the land of Raphaim. For Raphaim formerly lived in it, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. So these are groups of people that we get more information later by the battle that takes place later, but we hear from that and we understand from that these were the large people is saying they were, they were great in size. They were poss possibly part of the Anakim that we hear about in scripture. Um, who else was it said here in the land of Moab? Um, I don't remember what else we said now. Ammonites, that was the other. Okay. Now, when we go back with that in mind, we know we've got a number of peoples. Remember how we, we read from the Tower of Babel, these tribes began to form, these groups began to form. We didn't have at the beginning of creation the world as we have it today, where we have Africans and where we had Egyptians and where we had, you know, all these different people groups all over the face of the earth. But as they moved out from the Tower of Babel and settled in different areas, then they developed into what we have finally today. So here's, you know, initial where some of these we can tell as we move further down history who was there earlier. Going back to chapter 14, and going back to the verse that we're in. <coughs> there we go. Okay, so we are still in verse 5. Going back there, we've talked about Raphaim and the Zuzim in Ham. That's Ham, okay? That's, that's the descendants from his line. This is eastern Gilead, south of Bashan. What that means is that we're still on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and if we looked across the map, we would see we're between Galilee and Jericho. So we've moved down a little more. So we've got here and here, and now we're talking about here, but all on that eastern side. Then the next that's mentioned is Emim, and the Emim, or Emim's, uh, Deuteronomy 2, verses 10 and 11, I should have kept us there, but if you go back and look on your own, the name means terrible ones. These were possibly giant people, and I don't mean, I mean large people again. I don't mean that they were, you know, bizarre giants, but they were large people, and they settled in the area that the Moabites will settle in later. So we're, when you think of Ruth the Moabitess, and you know that she came from the east side, came across, that's the area that we're talking about. The next name we have is in Sheva Kiryatim. That's east of the Dead Sea in the land of Moab. So we're still on Jordan's side. We're moving a little further down south. 
that was a plain near the city of Kiriatim of Moab, and afterward the tribe of Reuben is going to settle in that area. So when you see where the tribe settled, when you see the map, you know it's Reuben's area eventually. But of course at this point there's not the tribe of Reuben. He's not even born yet. Uh, but again, archaeologists have discovered these towns and they found that they were heavily fortified at the time that we know Avram lived. So uh, they were definitely cities, peoples, they had, you know, the, a semblance of, of city life. Um, I don't mean in the same way we do today, but I do mean in the same way, in the sense that this knocks out again the evolutionary process of people living through ice ages and this and that and developing, you know, from the the caveman, you know, concept of dragon woman <laughs> hitting with club, you know, to finally getting some sense. No, no, it, the Bible does not give room for that. All these countries that we've mentioned en route to the five kings, archaeology says they were laid waste and the spoil was used to enrich Kedorla Amor, the one that I told you was the head of the, the, the ones that came down. So he's battled with them. He's pretty much knocked them out. What's believed, and, and I may be a little early, I may need to repeat it again, but what is believed is that he's taking out any who could come after him while he keeps on coming down. So he's leaving nobody behind to be a threat to him. He's not going to have to watch his rear guard. He's going to be able to just keep moving forward. But again, there's a lot of cruelty that's involved in that. There's a lot of just bloodshed. Verse 6 <laughs> Excuse me. As we move on, and the Horites in their Mount Seir. The Horites are known as the Hurrians. Uh, it sounds like hurry up, but spell it H U R R I A N. The Hurrians of secular history, and they could have been cave dwellers. Again, not the caveman mentality of the, the um, evolution uh, belief but that they did dwell in caves. That was what their area was like, and they dwelled in caves. They possibly came down from northern Mesopotamia and settled in Syria and in what will be called Palestine before 2000 BC. They found thousands of tablets that show they had business documents and they had other records that, that they had a, a highly civilized life. So even though I'm telling you they lived in caves, they lived a very civil life. Okay, that's our Horites. Mount Seir, it later became the country of the Edomites. That's the ones that descend from Esau. And we uh, read, we touched on that in Deuteronomy again, chapter 2 and verse 22. That's now south, but still east of the Dead Sea. So now we've come down a little bit further even. We go from Mount Seir as far as El Paran. That's the southern wilderness. It means the terebinth. And the terebinth we know is a small, they call it a European tree. Don't ask me why. It's not, that's what it's called. Um, or it's known as the Oak of Paran because this is the area of Paran. So uh, Mesta had groves of trees, that's all I can figure. Although I say that tongue in cheek because around me, we have an apple valley that you will not find one apple in. And we have an oak glen where you will find apples and no oaks. <laughs> so go figure. But we'll take it that they did have a lot of terebinth trees in this area. <coughs> they can argue with me when we find out in the end. Let me read to you a little bit more about them because that's in our book of Genesis, so we're going to come across it, but by the time we do, you won't remember, you know, it's too far because we're going all the way to chapter 21, and at the pace Rochelle goes from 14 to 21 will take us a little bit of time. So uh, Genesis 21, verse 14, we read there, So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, and gave them to Hagar, putting them on her shoulder, and gave her the boy and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now that's the area I'm talking about, that southeast of the Dead Sea. That's the area there is known as Beersheba. Drop down with me to verse 20 and 21. And by the way, this is when Abraham sends out <coughs> Hagar, and her son Ishmael because of the, the they can't get along in the house with Sarai and the, the son of promise Yitzhak, Isaac. 
verse 20 of chapter 14. God was with the lad and he grew. He lived in the wilderness and he became an archer. He lived in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. She came from Egypt. So she went on down south, picked up a wife, brought her back up, and they lived in that wilderness area called Paran. So that's the same Paran that we're talking about here in chapter 6. It's just by the time, I mean, sorry, chapter 14, verse 6. It's just by the time we get down to Abraham and what we just read, times have changed. Roger's trying to pull you up a map, and if he gives you something that's worth it, good for him. I looked at plenty that could do nothing but confuse us trying to do it as a whole, but if it works, that's great. I will go back to Genesis chapter 14, and I think we're ready for verse 7. Uh, yes, okay. The, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. We just read about that wilderness in chapter 21. Again, that's below Beersheba, and it possibly went as far south as Elot, which is on the tip of the Red Sea. Elot is still considered Israel, but <coughs> once you get down below, then you're in Egypt. You know, So it's, it's going almost all the way down. Lots of beautiful little um, resort-type the joke down in Elot is if there's a cloud in the sky, they take the children out of the classroom outside to see what a cloud looks like. <laughs> so just a little insight to the weather there. Verse 7, then they turned back. So they've gone down as far south, down as they're going to go now. They've gone, uh, they've stayed on the eastern side of the Jordan. They've come all the way down. They've come all the way down almost to the Red Sea. Now they're going to turn around. They're going to go up. Okay, and as they go up, they turn back, and they came to an Mishpat, that is Kadesh. Okay, that's on the border of Edom. It's about 50 miles south of Beersheba, and it's about 70 miles from Hebron, or Hebron. That's where Avram is dwelling. We're going, we saw that in chapter 13, verse 18, right at the end, we saw that he settled in Hebron. On the southwestern side of the Dead Sea now, so we're coming around the Dead Sea where we're going to be able to go back up. Um, this is the area where later Miriam, Moshe, Moses' sister, this is where she will die and be buried. Bamidbar, Numbers, chapter 20 and verse 1 tells us that about Miriam, that this is the area where she died and was buried. But staying with our chapter so we don't get too confused, they turned back, they came to Enbishpat and conquered all the country of the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites were rough, predatory, marauding type people. They roamed through the wilderness, they roamed through what was called Southern Palestine, it should have been called Southern Israel, but they called it that. They, um, and these people, these Amalekites, proved to be a constant menace to the Israelites all the way through our biblical days. All the days of the kingdom of Israel, they descended from Amalek, the grandson of Esau. So when we call them Amalekites, obviously that's a name that comes later. That's who these people become or, or as others come in and settle in that area, it's Amalekites that they're known for. So this has to be an editorial note. This has to be something that Moshe has put in because he's the writer that he mentions that to help the people identify the territory and the borders for when they were, when, when they were reading what he had written. He's not saying that there were Amalekites back then because there weren't yet. There wasn't the Esau to be the descendant from to be the name that they thought. But Moshe, knowing, because times moved down from when chapter 14 happened, he's looking back and he adds in a note, it would be like us saying, hey, by the way, that's the area of so-and-so. If we knew that somebody had moved into that area and we were trying to explain it a little more clearly. So I hope that explains that to you and doesn't confuse you. There are those who look at it and say, see the Bible, it, they added to it. No, the author added to it the knowledge of his day by the wisdom, the guidance of the Holy Spirit to include it for understanding. Okay? Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to see a couple other notes like that where someone has... Uh, 
by divine inspiration, put in an explanation to understand. Um, and that does not happen today. That happens before the books are completed and given to us as they are. So by the time Moshe completes, nothing more is added, nothing's taken away. That's what comes down to us today. We don't make those changes. We can, in commentaries, comment on them and help people understand, but we're no longer, you know, I, I want us to realize we're not adding into scripture. I hope I'm being clear. I feel like I'm being as clear as mud today, but I hope I'm making sense. So the Amorites, who are also mentioned here in verse 7, and I'm going back to it myself. Okay, the, the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazan Tamar, the Amorites were a tribe that descended from Canaan, from Canaan. Um, Genesis 10, 15 and 16 tells us about the Canaanites. It, it gives us that background. They lived in the hill country, and this is an area that's hilly. That's why they, they would be called that, known for that. And Ha'azan Tamar is on the west side of the Dead Sea. And for any who are familiar, and I don't think that map is going to show it. No, it's not. But for any who are familiar with where En Gedi is, that's what this area was later called, was En Gedi, where David hid in the caves. Might not even be on there. I don't see it, Roger. That's why it, it was impossible to get one map that could show enough that we could stay with it and not, you know. Yeah. If I could lay them out in front of you, if I could put several <coughs> up, it would have been different. But uh, if you're confused when you're studying it on your own, send me a note and I'll help you through the confusion. Uh, just know basically, they went down this side of the Dead Sea, across, and now they're coming up on the other side. That, that makes it simple. Um, and how do we know it's later called uh, En Gedi? Let's go to Second Chronicles, chapter 20 and verse 2. Second Chronicles, chapter 20 and verse 2. Okay, I cannot get my tablet to let me in. There we go, there we go. Whoops, I'm in and then I knocked myself out. There we are. Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 2, where we read, Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of the Aram, and behold, they are in Ha'azan Tamar, and then in parentheses, that is in Gedi. So that's how we let scripture help us understand scripture, or scripture interpret scripture. How do we know that in Gedi was Ha'azan Tamar? Because Second Chronicles recorded it that way. And we know what's recorded in the word of God is true. So that's how we get it, just so you see a little more clearly. Um, we're not guessing. We're not following uh, the historians. We're following what God has given to us, which is history, but he's given it to us in um, accuracy. So, this route that the conquerors is, have taken was well known in antiquity. They came down what's called, even to today, the King's Highway. Uh, Petra's in those hills. And when you go to Petra, you go down, you travel on the King's Highway to get down to Petra. Again, we see all this in Scripture. On your way back to Genesis, stop off with me at Numbers. But Midbar, Numbers chapter 20 and verse 17. Numbers 20 and verse 17, we have, Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or other vineyard. We will not even drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway, not turning to the right or the left until we pass through your territory. That was, if you looked up in verse 14 from Kadesh, Moshe sent messengers to the king of Edom. Please let us go through. We'll stay to the king's highway. We're not going to go interrupt your life, the life of your people. We're not here to maraud. We're not here to um, plunder. We're here just to pass through. That's Numbers uh, chapter 20, verses 17. Well, I think, okay, let me take you also to chapter 21 in Numbers, the next chapter. Chapter 21 and verses <coughs> 21 and 22. Where we read there, Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your land. We will not turn off into the field or vineyard. We won't drink water from your wells. We'll go by the king's highway till we pass through your border. So there you have it again. It was the, the main thoroughfare. 
It would be like somebody saying today, I want to get on the freeway and pass through San Bernardino, Colton, Riverside, Grand Terrace, Riverside. You know, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to do any damage to the countries. I'm just going to keep going. King's Highway. And again, it's a path that, that we use even today in traveling through that area. It went down the eastern side of the Jordan. It, they went the, those who were talking about went as far as the Negev Desert, which is the south area. Negev means go south. And again, they may have gone all the way down to Elat on the Red Sea, turned somewhere around there. Roger's trying to follow it, and I appreciate that. Um, go down a little further because you're at the Dead Sea. Now, oh, your map quits on you. Yeah. Okay, now it would be below that map. Uh, if you know the geography at all, you go down, you'll come finally to the Red Sea, and you'll be down into Egypt. Before they got into Egyptian territory, the desert down there is called the Arba, A-R-A, B as in boy, A-H. It's um, a rift valley. That means that there are mountain ranges and there are valleys in that area. It's south of the Dead Sea. Arba goes all the way down to the Red Sea. They call that whole region Arba. And then they went, so they kind of came down, went through there, and then they came up to Kadesh. Kadesh is, is over toward uh, Ha'azan Tamar and Gedi, like I told you, on the western side. And then to the region of Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, they call that area the Vale or the Valley of Sidim, S-I-D-D-I-M. That's the south end of the Dead Sea today. So if Roger finds one that's ancient, it might have those names. But we know it's the south end of the Dead Sea. Again, our archaeologists come into play and they've found every village in that area had been plundered and left in ruins. For hundreds of years after such an invasion, the entire area was abandoned like a cemetery. It was hideously unkempt with all its monuments shattered and strewn in pieces on the ground, according to the archeological historical um, records that they have found. Historically, about 1900 BC, there was such a thoroughgoing um, destruction visited on this area, the fortresses, the settlements, everything, that the particular civilization that was represented at 1900 BC never recovered. It never existed again. They wiped out those people that were living at that time in that area. The invasion had crushed all the tribes north, east, and west of the Dead Sea. All that area. These kings coming in did all that, that damage before it reached the five cities on the southern shores. And the purpose, again, of this preliminary battle probably was to eliminate the possibility of being attacked while they're being occupied with the five kings. So the four are coming. They know they're going to do battle with the five kings. They just wipe out everybody in between so that the, no, they don't have to worry about anybody picking back up after they've moved through their area and coming after them from the rear. So... Um, again, cruel, harsh to them, survival. Back to Genesis 14, we will go to verse 8. And in verse 8 we read, And the king of Sodom, remember Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah, the southern tip of the Dead Sea. So when you look at your map, they're at the southern tip. We well, don't see them there because they're not there today. We'll find out why in chapter 19. <laughs> but right now, you probably know the, the historical uh, story anyway. So right now they're there and verse 8 tells us the king of Sodom and the king of Amorah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Balak. That is Zoar came out. Five of them. They arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidim where I just took you to the southern end of the Dead Sea. So these five are coming to fight the four right there. The five kings of southern Again, they'll call it Palestine in your historical records. That bothers me because it's a false name. I'll call it Israel. The, the five kings from the south have now combined forces to engage the armies of Kedor. They know they've got a battle coming. And so that's who we're reading about in here, that they came against Kedor la Amur and his cohorts. I'll say it that. Whoops. My whole Bible just disappeared. There we go. Sorry, folks. I don't dare touch this today. 
Okay, so verse 9 tells us that they came to fight against Kedorla Amur, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against the five. Those are ones we read about early on, um, the armies in verse 5. So they're arrayed, and they are ready to do battle. That's what verse 9 tells us that, I mean, I'm sorry, verse 8 is telling us that they are ready to come fight against them. They know the battle is on. Um, and that's why it's saying against these other kings. What happens? The Valley of Sidim, um, verse 10, the Valley of Sidim was full of tar pits. You may have another name. You may have slime pits, but there's also another name, and it's, it flees from my mind. Clay pits, there's still another. Um, it'll come up in my notes. I'm, I, oh, I just found it. Bitumen, B I T. U-M-E-N, that's asphalt. We've studied that before. If you remember when we talked about Noah's Ark, we talked about that type of, of pitch, okay? So this is the tar pits, the slime pits, the asphalt pits. It would have been liquid petroleum. Uh, natural gas probably escapes from this area. The minerals would be very rich in the area, but we know it best for sealing objects like the Ark. Um, even Moshe's little basket, would, that's what they pitched it with, okay? And they were probably still half filled with this bubbling liquid. So the Valley of Sedim has these slime pits, these tar pits in the midst of it. Look out, that, that's a warning. But what happens? Um, the kings of Sodom and Amorah fled. So they're starting to lose the battle. They're fleeing and they fell into them. They fell into those pits. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Remember, it's a hilly country around there too. Now, it was from these also, these pits, that the Egyptians got the bitumen. And they used it to embalm their dead. Okay, sorry, but it would also cement bricks together. It would be what the Tower of Babel used. Remember when they were trying to make, you know, they would make an, an edifice, a, a front, you know, that would be strong. It was this pitch that would be used. They found it in ziggurats that were left. Um, and sometimes it was nicknamed the Jews pitch. So if you ever hear that, that was a new one to me. But the Jews pitch, because it's pitch, it's tar, it's asphalt, it's, you know, this, this, gluey, gooey stuff, okay? So they fled. They were trying to escape. They fell. It probably means they were defeated there. But the king of Saddam does appear again in verse 17. So it's not likely he was killed in the pit, unless this is a new king, but it's highly unlikely that they could get themselves a new king and be in the midst of battle right away. So it probably <clears throat> isn't. It probably didn't mean that they... Um, lost their lives, but in, in the running and falling into these pits, you can just see it was a mess and they were losing. Yeah. And uh, uh, some of the inhabitants probably fell in also. It just tells us about the, the leaders that got into trouble in that area. You got to yes. figure too, if, they're, if it's that sticky and they fall into it, no matter what they got, their arms would stick together, stick to their body maybe, their legs stick together. Yeah, getting out of it would be one thing, but moving once you got out of it. And if it got sun time, the sun hit it, then it would oh, hard, man. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if they hit any feathers, the the meaning of being tarred and feathered yeah. would certainly, yeah. So yes, yeah. I imagine you know it was a hard thing to get out of, literally. Mm -hmm. So yes. So anyway, they fled to the hill country, to the mountains on either side of the southern part of the Dead Sea. That could be <clears> the mountains of Moab on the east, and the mountains of Arad. You know, all of that, there are many different mountainous areas in that area that when it says that they fled to the hill country. Um, verse 11, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Amorah and all their food supply and departed. So this is the, the victors, not the ones that, that were losing. When they lost, when they fell, when they had their, their issues, then the others swooped in and got their their goodies. Um, they didn't leave an army here to possess the land. They just basically collected all the tribute, probably reduced any rebels to subjection, made slaves out of anybody who would rebel, so that if there was anything happening in the future, these people would count out. They'd be afraid to rise up against 
Kedlimer, they'd be on his side if they even survived. So basically, they've just about annihilated the area. They've left behind those either so subjugated or so reduced that they can't pick up and fight against them. And if they happen to manage to survive and, and can live some kind of a life, even though Kid Lemmer is going to go back home, he's going to know they're his, under his thumb. They, they're going to be afraid to ever come up against him because of how powerful and uh, ornery, not the right word, but it works for them. And they took everything that was of any value. So they basically left the, the poor of the land, the ones that couldn't move and travel, the ones that'd be no value to them. They, they're leaving them behind to exist, if they can exist without anything left behind for them to exist with. Goods means any movable property. So they took, if they had cattle, that would have been taken with them. There goes milk, there goes meat, you know, there goes food supply. They probably um, took anything that, that vegetation, vegetation that was uh, harvested, probably was just scooped up and taken so that, like I said, they just about destroyed the area completely. And in this, they also took Lot. That's what we're told in verse 12. They also took Lot, Avram's nephew, and his possessions as his family, that's his slaves. Remember, he had a lot of um, uh, servants and all because his servants were fighting Avram's servants. So they won quite a battle and they picked up Lot and all his his servants and they carried them off with him and whatever property wasn't literally glued to the crown, they took with them also. Um, they took his possessions, they departed for he was living in Saddam. Notice how he's taken another step down. The last we had read of him, he had pitched his tent near Saddam. Now he's living in Saddam. And in Saddam, he goes into captivity. So he's kept continually moved it down further and further. Um, and that's the result of living in the world. We think that we can be near it. We think we can rub shoulders with it. The next thing we know is we're part way in, then we're fully in, and it will take us all the way down. But God is faithful, and God is going to save him, really basically because he belongs to God. Not because he's deserving, but because he belongs to God. When he separated himself from Avram, he pretty much was walking away from anything godly, but God pulls him back uh, because God saw him as justified. That's in, uh, go with me to 2 Peter. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. We'll start there. 2 Kepha, 2 Peter 2, starting with verse 6, where we read about Lot. And this is the grace of God. It's the way for any of us, but let me just read it first. 2 Peter 2, verse 6, And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he, meaning God, rescued righteous lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. Wow, what a description. Lot being is righteous, but he's being oppressed by men who are living by their, their sensual senses, and they don't have principles. They're living ungodly. They're living the, the world's worst is what we're seeing here. Verse 8, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, Lot, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. So he lived in the midst of a pit of sin. It vexed him. It troubled his spirit because his, his knowing better was in him. He had obviously to be called righteous, had faith in the one true and living God of Israel. And it's like the, the Christian in the world of idolatry in the world of false religions and and all there may be things that entice but it has to vex that spirit they have to feel uncomfortable they have to know that that they're not in the right place and they're not where they belong and that's what it's saying that he was he battled it day after day because of their lawless deeds and we know the people he was living around we'll deal with that harshly in chapter 19 if you don't know read ahead but they were not living a lifestyle that was the way God intended. 
and I cannot imagine him being happy in the midst of that. Why he stayed, that's beyond me. I think it must have been because of his family, because we know not all of his family was believers, but he paid a price. He was miserable down there. Verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Lot couldn't stay away. He was too weak, but the Lord knew how to pull him out of it. And to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Those who were living that life contrary to God, you know, what he called right, and they, they are doing it, will suffer those consequences. That's what it's saying, that they are being kept for that day of judgment. They will be punished for what they were doing. And verse 10, especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. When the angels even came, they wanted to do horrendous acts to even these who were from God. That's just about as depraved as you can get in this way. They were as depraved as I'm saying and even worse read between my lines. And Lot in the midst of that, God knew how to bring him out because he belonged to God. But he was not happy there, he was not comfortable there, and he shouldn't have been. If he could have been, I don't think he could have been saved. So it's why he was miserable. And when we put ourselves in a position where we end up with a lot of misery, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Because if we're taking the, the Holy Spirit within us into an environment that is not right, not where it should be, then the Holy Spirit has a right to convict us and make us miserable, and we will feel that way because we've got a taste of the better. And uh, sadly, uh, Lot is returned to Sodom. He goes back to where he was living, even when he gets rescued from this battle. You would think he'd begin to wake up and realize, wow, the hand of God protected me. I better be right under the hand of God to save me. But sadly, he makes no changes. He stays in Sodom. In chapter 19, he has to be saved again from himself. He is saved from Sodom and Amorah, from the judgment that did fall on them then. But if you go all the way to his end, and if you don't know his end, we'll read about it. Uh, it's a sad end. He, he ends up um, in a little place, <laughs> in a nether and godly situation. Um, read chapter 19, verses 30 to 38, if you don't know what I'm talking about. We'll, we'll deal with it verse by verse oh, over there. Of Genesis, to get Lot, what happens to Lot. When he has to leave Sodom and Amorah because they're going to be destroyed, <coughs> and he, he goes and his two daughters with him, and I'm telling you the story now. But read it for the <laughs> details on your end. That is okay. when they have incestuous relationships with their father, and they produce two of the enemies of Israel in the future. So, yes. Okay, One. what tribe would you say those kids belong to? There Are weren't Israelite? tribes yet. There weren't tribes yet. This is before the tribes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when I use the fact, I use the word that these tribes went out from the Tower of Babel, I probably shouldn't have used that word because if it made you think of the 12 tribes, because we don't have. Okay. We're okay. still Abraham, we've got to get to Isaac, we've got to get to Jacob, and then we get yeah. the 12 tribes. Okay, but, so, so uh, why did the Lord turn his wife into salt when salt is supposed to be... <laughs> a good preservative? <laughs> um, Dora wants to know ahead. She's asking the question, why did God turn her his wife into a pillar of salt when salt isn't... It, you know, we're supposed to be salt to the world. Um, she is now. <laughs> I, think, I think in that sense, we're supposed to be a testimony. We're supposed to, to bring the world something better. She's a testimony <clears throat> in what happened to her because she wasn't right with the Lord. That's a short answer. Um, I'll look and see if I can get anything better on that. We may have to ask God that way. <laughs> Why a pillar of salt? What, what did that mean? But I'll go digging when we get to um, chapter 19. I'll go digging. You're just once again ahead. I love my students who run ahead of me, but... I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. No apology. I just don't have the answers I might have when I study, you know, get insight from the Lord or find something that resonates, you know, with my spirit. But um, um, 
it wasn't, it, it was a judgment. We know that. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe because I'm even just thinking the fire and brimstone, maybe it's a, a oh, what's the word, you know, comes out of that. A, um, oh, there's a good word for it. Uh, result of is what I'm trying to say. Maybe the brimstone has a salty, <coughs> leaves a salty something. I don't know though. I don't know. I'm not telling you it does. I have, that's where I go research. <laughs> yes? I know that uh, when you get salt on a wound, it stings, but it also helps heal it too. Right, right. The Dead Sea is such an example of that. The salt content is so high. When I was in yeah. the Dead Sea, the salt is very sharp. Mm -hmm. And you can't see everywhere. There are some places you can see a little better, but these pillars of salt that you see on top of the water are mm -hmm. under the water also. And I came across one midway on my leg, the calf area. I felt it. And I knew it was quite a gash. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm in the water cutting it. The salt immediately is into it. And I mean, yeah, you want to scream, you want to <laughs> holler. But... By the next morning, I did it that like early evening, and by the next morning, it was almost 100% healed. I've never seen anything heal so fast wow. in my life because it was deep. It was a very deep cut, <laughs> but I thought, wow, I see the healing powers right there on my home leg. It was, it was worth getting cut. <laughs> so, sidetrack. We'll pick that up more when Sorry. we get there. No, it's okay. Any other questions, comments? Are we good? Okay. I don't have a whole lot of faces today, so I'll lean heavily on the few that I do have. <laughs> all right. I think we are ready for verse 13. Did I do all of 12? Oh, no, I haven't done 12. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in, I'm in 2 Peter. No wonder it doesn't make any sense. Let me get back to Genesis. There we go. Okay. Um, I did all of 12. We, the fact that Lot was living where he shouldn't have been, he gets caught, he gets taken away. So verse 13 tells us, Then a fugitive came and told Avram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshel, and brother of Anir, and these were allies with Avram. I went ahead and read the whole verse, but did you catch my emphasis? There's a new word in here. <coughs> Hebrew. This is the first time it's used in the Bible. And it probably comes from the Hebrew word Eber, E-B-E-R. Oh. Hebrew probably comes off of that. That was the descendant of Shem. We saw his name in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25, that one of Shem's sons was Eber. And we said then, that's where the word Hebrew developed from. And we know that it meant one from the other side, one who crossed over. We know that it may have meant literally for Avram, he crossed over the Euphrates River in his travel to come following God into the promised land. We know that it continues to be used crossing over from idolatry to worshiping the one true and living God. So it comes to have a lot of meaning. At this point, Avram is being identified as that one who has separated crossed over the river, crossed from idolatrous lifestyle, and he is now being known as that one who crossed over. Um, from Joseph on, Abram's family, his whole family is called Hebrews. But that's Joseph, you know, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has Joseph, and Joseph goes on. That's a ways down the line. You can see that in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 14. In 41 and verse 12, in 43 and verse 32, and even in Shemot, Exodus 1 and verse 15, leading into what we know as the, the story of Passover. Um, let me give you just one example, just so you know I can back up what I'm saying. You can look up those verses later. <coughs> we'll just take the first one, Genesis 39 and verse 14. And we'll read in Genesis 39, 14. Yosef's already in Egypt, successful at this point. And in verse 14, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came to me to lie with me, and I screamed. I didn't remember which story I was <laughs> stepping into. That's when um, Potiphar's wife 
tries to claim that Joseph made advances on her that were improper and he gets thrown into prison for it. It was part of God's plan to take him to the throne. But anyway, notice how, how it's the Hebrew. They became known as the Hebrews by this point and going on. But back in chapter 14, it's the first use of it. It singularly meant about Abraham because he crossed over the Euphrates and he crossed over from idolatry to worshiping the one true and living God. I don't even think that they would recognize that second reason. We recognize it. But I don't think, you know, they, they knew he had a different God, but that's probably about all the, the um, outside world would have thought. Okay, so he, they, this future came and told Avram the Hebrew what happened. Now, he was living by the Oaks of Mamre, the Amorite. Okay, that means he had settled down here. It's indicating that was his central point, his main home in Canaan. Remember, God had told him to, to go through the land. God is showing him the land. God is promising him the land. And now he has settled. He's living out of that one area. Um, down here, um, I don't want to say too much until we get there. Okay? Right now, it's just being called by the Oaks of Mamre. And again, Mamre was the name of a person, <clears throat> the Amorite, the brother of Eshel. Okay? Now... What we're seeing in this verse is that Avram also had allies. The same way Kedol Armar had allies and had them fight with him, Avram has allies. He has three brothers that are named here, um, Mamre, Eshkol, and Anir. And uh, um, in essence, when they're with him, they've made a covenant with him. And probably they all decided they probably each one of them had servants and they had, you know, their livestock and all. So they're not living like you do with your neighbor on, the, you know, right next door. But they'd be the next farm over, so to speak. The next area over. So what they basically, what we're getting, the idea is that they would all help defend each other. They were allies of each other. If somebody attacked one, kind of like what we're supposed to do with NATO, but it would have been their closer neighbors. Um, if if one, if a, an army came against let's say, Enner, then all four of these, Avram and the three, would all fight with Nir. If, in this case, it's going to be Avram that they've come against, they're going to help Avram, and that's what we're going to see. And probably that was a common occurrence against the marauders and the invaders of the, that day was that cities, city-states would have those who would... Um, band together, and I think Avram was more like a nomadic type lifestyle, but his farm, I don't know the right word to call it, his <coughs> cattle, you know, his property, and those with him would fight for the others who have property like-minded around him. So, what happens? When Avram heard that his relative, Lot, had been taken captive, he let out his trained men born in his house. 318 and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Wow. Okay. What we've got is that the three brothers, since they were allies with Avram in verse 13, are moving with Avram in verse 14. When he heard that lot, and in the Hebrew it's the same word for a relative, for a you know, nephew, sometimes it's even a cousin, but it's the same word. Um, when Avram had heard that lot had been taken, then he led out his trained <coughs> men, his trained servants. The Hebrew says they were practiced in arms. So it's like Avram had his own little military. They were ready to defend. They were ready to fight. Probably the lifestyle what they had to be in that day. They had to be able to defend quickly. They couldn't learn how to fight when they needed it. They had to know how to fight ahead of time. So Avram had trained men. He had practiced men. When it says that they were armed, they literally drew out the sword or the scabbard. I guess it drew out the sword out of the scabbard, out of the sheath. But it was saying they were ready for battle. So he gets every available man and he takes them into action. He's got 318. Anur and Eshkol um, and Mamre are going to have their men probably also just as, as well trained. That's going to be like an army in no time. That's, that's a group that comes together. And 318 that were born in Avram's house alone, that shows great wealth. That is an impressive crew. Now, if you think how many kids each family had back then, 
you could get that number quickly. You could see how it would grow rapidly. And it wasn't that he had to live there 50 years, but you know, as he brought his servants down, they settled with them. They had children, children had children, etc. Anyway, this is the only time though that we find Avram engaged in military battle. Even though obviously he was ready, there may have been other wars we don't know about, but it shows how gracious and loving he was toward Lot. Because he could have easily said, he chose his way, he chose to live where he shouldn't, he went the way of the world, he can suffer the consequences. We hear people make comments like that all the time, do we not? It serves him right. <laughs> but that's not what Avram did. Avram was magnanimous in his love, in his character, and he reached out in that to Lot at his time of need. Avram, because he had stayed away from the city, had a people, had a trained people, had a ready people, because he wasn't living a compromised life, living a worldly life. Lot wouldn't have had an army in the city of Sodom. Who knows what happened to his servants, where they were when he's having fun with the men he shouldn't be having fun with and having his soul vexed. You know, who knows what was happening in his household. But Avram kept a household that was honoring to God, and God had him well prepared for what was needed. So staying out of the world has its benefits in more ways than, than not. Um, so he goes in pursuit and went as far as Dan. Dan is earlier time, this again is a note, Dan didn't live yet, Dan didn't have his territory in Israel yet, so this is another one of those editorial notes. Moshe knows the area we're talking about is where Dan is. So by the time he's completing the five books that he's putting his signature on, he wants people to understand. So he lets them know this is the area of Dan, but it's called Leshem and Laish in other places in Scripture. Let me show you that. Joshua, Yeshua, chapter 19. We'll go there first. Yeshua, chapter 19. Joshua, chapter 19. And here we read in verse 47, chapter 1947 of Yahshua, The territory of the sons of Dan proceed beyond them, for the sons of Dan went up and fought with Leshem and captured it. Then they struck it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and settled in it, and they called it Leshem Dan, after the name of Dan, their father. So he just gave us a whole history how it came to be called Dan, but it started out being Leshem, okay? Now, go to Judges 18. Right after Joshua, the next book is Judges. Go to Judges chapter 18, and we're going to look at verse 29. Judges 18 and verse 29. And here we also have, they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, who was born in Israel. However, the name of the city formerly was Laish. So, and I should be saying Don, but if I say Don to you, you think of another man's name. <laughs> so, we'll call him Dan in our English. Dan is an area that was called Leshem, was called Laish. The Danites took it, they named it Dan after the head of the tribe, Dan, who settled in that area. Again, an editorial note, um, and actually a misspoke because this one, even Moses could not have written this one because he died before the Danites took it. So to say that, to make it that clear that the Danites took this land, it probably was an editorial note by Ezra, the skilled scribe, the teacher who had very extensive training in the books of the law. After he returned to Yerushalayim, and you read that in his book, Ezra, that's named for him, he apparently did a lot of work on the Hebrew Bible at that time. He probably helped modernize the language. He probably corrected any little irregularities if there was such a thing in the text. He updated it. He, he standardized it, gave the expressions in certain passages that would be understood. It would be like you taking something that you knew how things had developed and you just polished it up a little bit. You're not changing it. You're not changing the truth, you're not adding in, but you're helping somebody who came down the line later understand 
oh, this, I know this area because I know the tribe of Dan. So I get it. I didn't know where Laish was. I didn't know what Leshem was, but I know what Dan is. So it would help them understand. Um, Rhonda, I see your hand up, and then you're going to have to unmute yourself. I don't know if she can or not. Okay. Sure. Roger's saying he might not be able to, but he's back to the control. Poor guy. The In second control. he goes away for some good reason, I catch him. Okay. Okay, try to unmute yourself now. Because you're still muted. There you go. Okay. Um, when we see that Moses wrote the, you know, the first five books, and when he's writing, he wrote these books while in the desert during that 40-year period, right? Um, not the 40-year period between his leaving Pharaoh's house and his leading the children of Israel out of the out of Egypt into the Promised Land because the books developed that story, so he couldn't have been writing that early. He could have been keeping the records as it happened, but it would be you know later on down the line when. Uh, although, uh, although we have to remember too, we see that they wrote all along. So Adam probably wrote the genealogy, passed it down to Seth, who passed it down, and we saw that. Remember when we see that that marking in the Hebrew. Um, and there'll be another one that'll come up in a while, and I'll remind us of it again, where it's like their signature. This is the part that they brought, but Moshe took it all, wove it together. It's like he got this chapter from Adam, he got this chapter from Seth, he got this chapter from somebody else, but he's the one who made it all come together, flow smoothly, and put his signature on the end where he, and he also wrote, you know, so much more that he gets credit for writing it all. Okay. And how do we know that? How do we know that that's how it came to be? We look at it from the Hebrew, from the phrases given when it says, um, and I'd have to go back real quick and see if I could find, and my tablet's not working enough. I can give you it next week again, uh, one of the references where it's like their signature, that these were the records of so-and-so. There are those who argue that, and they say that's not what it means, and I can't say dogmatically, oh, yes, it does, but it certainly makes more sense and is more understandable. What I can tell you is Scripture does tell us that every word is inerrant, that it was given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's in, in 2 Timothy 3. comes way down the line because Paul's that author. But what that's telling us is true about all our scripture, that God, God worked in the minds of holy men. I shouldn't even put it that way, because God worked in the minds of men that he chose to write, who would listen to the Spirit and write as they heard, not as they thought, not as, oh, well, I like this idea, or I want to develop that. But they wrote what they were inspired to write. If you've ever had a time in your life where you've asked God to help you write something that was critical for a reason, and you know the Spirit of God was just, it was flowing so fast out of you, you knew you weren't writing it. Right. That, you know, so the reason why I asked that question is because, you know, I just had like a recent revelation of certain things. I used to just think the Bible just was written through man by God. But when Adam wrote what was going on, he was writing on during his time, and he was also prophesizing of future events. And then Moses comes along and says, okay, let me put these five books together. And he takes from whatever Adam wrote and Seth wrote. So they are, in fact, prophecies. They're not Moses coming in and writing down history as he so sees it. I mean, from an outside look in, they might say, oh, this Moses guy just started writing history in his own words. But it's not like that. Adam and then he put them separate and he pulled it together. They, he pulled all their writings together to create the Torah, right? Well, we're talking more just the book of Genesis then, because by the time we get into Exodus, that is Moses living it. So right. It is but yeah, a, those, the, first, the Genesis book, the so Genesis to speak. Book, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 When you say the Torah, they're going to think five books. That's why I corrected that. Right. Part. Okay. But yeah. Yes. 
And if that bothers anyone, if you want to believe that God gave it all to Moshe, that he's the one that, that told Moshe how creation went and how, you know, all these things happen all the way up and through the parts that we know are Moshe's, that's fine with me too. I'm not here to say, oh no. Either way, God's the author. Either way, it was given to us in purity. It was given to us with, there's nothing we need to question. But when we see these inserts, I want us to understand that was only by one who was given authority by God to write those inserts. That's why it's not something we can come along and say, oh, well, I can add this in today because I understand better because I lived now, you know, so much closer to. Like, we can look at the book of Revelation and we can begin to pick up certain things and say, oh, John's talking about nuclear war, where they couldn't know nuclear war. They couldn't know what that word meant, nuclear, back in John's day. That's a commentary today. I can say that and help us understand what John wrote, but I'm not adding that into the Word of God. The only time anything was added in was before everything was finished and given to us as it's been given to us. And even then, it wasn't just anybody could add to it. Wikipedia, bless its heart, quick way to get you know, what you want, bad way to trust only one source because Wikipedia lets everybody add in. If I read something about the Maccabeans and I think, oh, they should have this fact and I add it in, they just take it and put it in. They don't research it and see if Rochelle was right or Rochelle was wrong. That's dangerous. <laughs> and that's what I'm telling us our Bible did not do. When Ezra is the most likely one that could um, have added the note that this was damned, because we know Ezra was a scribe, authority by God to write the word of God. He writes the book given by his name. He handled the other um, scrolls that were being passed down. It makes sense that it was he that added in that note. But done so by the inspiration of God, under the power of God, permitted by God, sealed, done, finished, don't add to the word of God. <laughs> okay? So, um, but either way, whether you want to believe that Adam helped in his portion, Seth helped in his portion, or whether you want to believe God just gave it all to Moshe, Scripture is not clear. That Hebrew phrase makes us think there were compilations. History makes us think there were compilations because we do know, even today, there are those who keep genealogical records. They keep them very well. They're authoritative. We can go to them and trust them because they've done that research. They, they've gotten into it and they know it. It's very likely people did keep records because they were um, highly educated. They, were, you know, they weren't developing. They were developed as human beings. They could make a whole city. They could, you know, they could build. They could do all the things that we don't want to say happened all at once. We want to say, oh no, they learned how to do that. No, they they came with those abilities. So that's what I'm trying to say is because of that, because of that Hebrew phrasing that pops up all the time. And I wish I could give you one example quick. If I brought my other Bible down, I could look fast. Um, I'll edit this so that somebody who doesn't come back in, and since we aren't picking up for a couple weeks. I'll add a note to the end of this video so those of you who listen by video or go check it out later on the bit.ly site, uh, bit.ly forward slash hcwperl, okay, that's where all the teachings go. Um, it'll have it added in there. I'll, I'll remind us of where those notes are. Um, and I can't think of the Hebrew word. I want to call it a toldot, and that's not quite right, I don't think, but it might be toldot. Anyway, it sounds very much like it's saying, he, Adam signing his name, here's what he wrote, and it was passed down. Moshe took and wove it all together, because we're only talking the book of Genesis. Moshe lived Exodus. He wrote Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's why his name goes on all of it, why we say the Torah was written by Moshe. But whichever way it was, it was God ordained, it was God breathed, it was God inspired, and it is trustworthy all the way to the end, and we don't need to go edit it, change it, add in anything. When we add our notes, our commentaries to help us understand that we have to recognize and say it as such. And that's why you'll hear me say, I think, 
or it seems or something like that because I don't put my words on the level of the Bible. You know, walk out the door and forget what Rochelle said. Walk out the door and remember everything God said. Okay? Everybody follow me? Everybody clear? Everybody okay? I, out of the couple of heads I can see, <laughs> I'm going to hope I've communicated it, it well. Um, but it, it does trip up people because they'll look at it, and I, maybe that's why I should make clear why I brought this out. They'll look at it and they'll say, see, the Bible's added in. People just wrote and added in and added in because there wasn't a tribe named Dan, so how did they get that in there? It has to be that it was edited. All you've got is an edited version of the Bible. You don't know whether you've got the truth or not. And that's where I'm saying, eh, uh-uh, no room for that. It, where God allowed an edited note to go in, it was still under his power, his authority, by whom he chose to write by the move of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So you can take your Bible and count on it. And not no one can tell you, oh, well, you've just got edited, you know, thoughts from people. No. Ask them to prove you where the Bible's wrong. Scientifically, mathematically, archaeologically, I don't care what direction you come at, you cannot find a fault in the scriptures because it was, it was done by God. So there's our authority on why we can trust it. And when we see all that proved, proven, whatever word I should be use, using, then it, it, it gives us the faith to keep believing. In other words, I do 100% believe Yeshua, Jesus is coming the second time because he did come the first time and he fulfilled every single prophecy that was said in relation to the first coming to the nth degree. There wasn't anything left out. And when I see something that exact, that profound, that many, over 300 prophecies that, that are, he fulfilled, one person fulfilling that, as God said, Wow, that's the power of my God, and that tells me every single scripture about the Lord's second coming is going to be fulfilled. It's going to be fulfilled exactly. You can dot every I and cross every T on every reference for the second coming too because I have no doubt, not when it, it, it's so right on target. If you took everything else out except prophecy, I think that alone is enough to, to win the case in court. It just, there's too much proof. There's so much in prophecy that even touches on the historical. Daniel writes, he writes in such detail about a battle that they say, oh, there's no way Daniel was a prophet telling this. He wrote it after the fact. It's history. And yet then they find a, a scroll that predated, that had it written, so they had to give in. They had to say, okay, if it was written, like I, and I forget the years, but if it was written so many years prior to when it really happened, and they authenticate that scroll to that time, then that shows he wrote prophetically. He didn't write historically. He wrote prophetically. And every time the Bible gets it right, every time, I just, I marvel at prophecy. But that gives me faith to believe in the rest. And that's why I, I just know the Word of God is authoritative. The Word of God is living. It's not dead. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It can cut right down to the bone and the marrow, and it can separate, and it can hit the nail on the head in your life in a way that you will know. This is God ordained. This is not of man. This didn't just come about. And that's why it has the authority to tell us how to live our lives. It gives us the roadmap to know how to be in a relationship with a God who masterminded this. What a plan. I mean, we haven't even gotten out of Genesis here. We haven't, we've, we're so far back in the B.C. And look at how amazing. Look at all it's taught us. Look at all it guides us. Look at all it feeds us. And we've got so much more to go. And it continues. It is just, it's amazing. Uh, you know, Rachel? Yes, ma'am. 
And this is Maria, uh, and you know, it, and I know that we we are uh, in Genesis, but we can always uh, see the First Kings seven, fourteen and fifteen. He's talking about the skill, you know. Yes. And and he says whose mother was a widow from the uh, tribe of Naphtali, and those whose mother, uh, father was from Tyre, uh, Tyre, Tyre, and a skilled craftsman in bronze. Who ran, he says, was filled with wisdom, with understanding, and with knowledge to do all kinds of bronze work. He came to King Solomon and did all the work assigned to him. So, right there is also, there was God. You know, God is the one that gives the wisdom. Yes. Amen. Amen. And a great example. And thank you for bringing it out. And I want to bring you Ezra's words also in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moshe, Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. So where, where did the law come from? Not from Moses. It came from God, written by Moses. And the king granted him all his requests because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him key right there just like what maria read to us in first king seven so i hope she's gonna pop back in i hope that was first king oh uh, first uh, first king seven, seven 14 and 15. 14 and 15 thank you good reference to add in here in fact let me write it down before i forget first king seven 14 and 15 thank you maria um, and here again, see how it's saying the hand of the Lord God guided Ezra, who was skilled as a scribe. The scribe, the sofer, was the one who was writing the scriptures for the people. They didn't write it down for themselves, and they weren't, everybody had their own like we do today. Verse 11 of the same chapter, Ezra 7. Now this is the copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes, or Hashvaris, gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe learned in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Verse 12, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven. Perfect peace. Shalom, shalom. And now, and it goes on from there. So you see how it's always pointing back. God, God um, en enabled them. Um, it was by the power of God. It was the wisdom of God that was on them. And even when they made the tabernacle and they made the temple, God was on them to do that because that had to be such an exact representation of the Lord himself. It couldn't have been man's doing. And that, again, is what's just absolutely mind-blowing. When you look at all of the pictures through the, the scriptures that are given of our Lord, Man couldn't do that. Man couldn't plan that ahead. And, and like I've said, prophecy of he himself, any of you, give me one person who can, and I'll make it easy, just 50 years into the future, tell us, who, name somebody and who they're going to give birth to and the city they're going to give birth in. Just 50 years from now. <laughs> and you know you're throwing a rock in the middle of a huge <laughs> and you're hoping you're going to hit your target <laughs> well we know Yeshua was foretold that his birth would be in Bethlehem by Miriam who didn't live in Bethlehem but she would be there um, what else was I, I said where and when and to whom okay and the time of his birth all of that foretold so that he came in that time and we know it was exactly right on target because we know from his crucifixion they could have lined the the um, roadway in the Jerusalem knowing when he was going to come in on that Palm Sunday riding lowly on a donkey and when he was going to be crucified on the cross it was because God gave the date in secular history and if they had counted down they could have known boom this is the day that's amazing and that's just a couple of examples by the time you get through with eight examples for one person to fulfill, the scientific probabilities are astronomical. By the time you get to 50, they're off the charts. Try 300 prophecies. Word of God can be trusted. <laughs> That's all I can say. Absolutely trustworthy all the way. Ezra being given this kind of position by God, 
had authority by God to to add in a note like this is the area that Dan settled in. It wasn't anything that he did of his own accord. It would have been God that did it and brought it down to us so that we understand better. That you know, I think I've said it. I don't think I need to say anymore. But um, but again, Moshe is going to get credit for the whole because he wrote more than the majority of it, you know, so I think you all understand. Um, I'm watching my time go. Verse 15, going back to Genesis bear sheep, chapter 14, verse 15. Um, we've got Avram that he heard Lot had been taken captive in 14 to bring our minds back. He had 318 men. He pursued as far as Dan. That's where we got off talking about how we know that how far he went, which is all the way up north. Um, in fact, I'll give you where that was. It's, it must be coming up. But if I forget to, it was the northern tip of Israel was the area that Dan settled in. Verse 15, he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and he defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Okay, when it says he divided his men, this was brilliant strategy. He divided so that they attacked from different directions. So he sent a group here, he sent a group here, he, he got them around, and they, because they did it at night, by nighttime, this was a surprise attack. Probably when the enemy was the least expecting it. You know, they've gotten their booty, they've left behind such utter destruction that they're not worried about the people coming back after them. They, they, the only ones that have been left behind can't do that, in their opinion. And, uh, and, you know, there's nothing. They're just going to either starve to death or they're going to be weak people that will never come up in, in Kedalarmar's face. Anyway, all of a sudden, and probably they took the booty back. Remember all the possessions and everything? They probably were having a party. What do you do when you've had a great victory? You celebrate. So I'll bet if they were awake, they were celebrating. If they weren't celebrating, they were sleeping. But anyway, surprise attack at night. They weren't expecting it, either sleeping or glorying in their booty. This is the same thing we saw with Gideon when he attacked with just 300 against the, the Midianites. And God had him use some of the same strategy. They were so few in number, but he spread them out. And he went at night. He had told them, have your torches hidden under the, the, the pot covering. And when I give the signal... Let the light out, blow the shofar, and run. And there were so many spread out that they thought it was ten thousands coming against them. They panicked. They ended up shooting, uh, not shooting, sorting, killing each other by the sword, running and, and <coughs> losing the whole battle. And Kideon won. Here's the same thing. Avraham defeated them by surprise attack by coming at night, by coming from different directions. It was great strategy. Where do you think he got that strategy? From God. Not from himself. This was from God. By the way, Gideon, if you want to read about it, is Judges chapter 7. You can start probably about verse 9 and read on down. When it says that he smote, if you have the old English, um, he, okay, he... Da, 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 da. Okay, where I don't even have it in mind, so I can't find it. Divided his sword forces, defeated them. You may you may have smote them right there instead of defeated. The idea still is that, that this was a success. And then it tells us that he went as far as Hobah. Hobah is a city <coughs> almost 50 miles north of Damascus, Syria. So he went and didn't just <coughs> stop in what we know of Israel territory and where Dan was, but he went all the way up into Syria. He was pursuing. Avram and his men covered over a hundred miles, even beyond Dan. It was more than that to get up to Dan, but a hundred miles from Dan on in pursuit. He took off, he's gone, he's hauling, and when he, he catches up to where they are, he, he defeats, and he has complete victory. This is our God. Our God was on Avram's side, and he wins. In verse 16, he brought back all the goods, and also brought back his relative lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. He went over 200 miles to rescue everybody. Didn't just rescue Lot, he rescued all of the people. That was quite a feat in those days. 
and he did it in great victory. He did it quickly. He, he just basically snatched out the people out from under them and what belonged to them, and he brought it back. Verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Kedalamur and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Avram at the valley of Shava. That is the king's valley. We, we named it earlier um, the Sedim area, okay, if I'm remembering right. Anyway, yeah. the king of Sodom, southern tip of the Dead Sea, this king is his area. Remember, he was one of the main ones in that area. He's coming out to meet Abraham here now. Um, he's heard about the victory, off, obviously. Um, okay, what do I want to tell you? The defeat, the slaughter, the smiting of, and the Valley of Shava means the Valley of the Plain, P-L-A-I-N. It was a, a, a smooth area, a plain, not the mountainous area. Um, and it's now called the King's Valley, or the King's Dale. Probably what's known as the Kidron Valley, on the east side of Jerusalem. It's probably all in that area. Uh, Josephus said it was about a quarter of a mile from Jerusalem. Yes, Dora? Isn't that where they said this is the first fight that was ever fought in Jerusalem, and that is where the Armageddon is going to be fought? It's the first recorded battle, yes. And it's not just in Jerusalem. It's in that whole area, because remember the Battle of Armageddon is four main locations, and it goes almost throughout the whole length of Israel. And yes, did you notice how the kings came down and they went up? Yes, the, it is. It's the same area that the last battle, the Battle of Armageddon, will be fought in also. Yeah. Yeah. I want to take you real quick to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 18. 2 Samuel 18 and verse 18. And here we read. Now Absalom, this is one of David's sons, in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself a pillar which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to preserve my name. So he named the pillar after his own name and is called Absalom's Monument to this day. And they'll drive you through this valley and show you where there is a monument that they believe is Absalom's Monument to this day. Because he didn't want to be forgotten and apparently it worked because we're talking about him in 2022. <laughs> okay? But notice that it's the same, it's called the same thing, the King's Valley. That was 2 Samuel 18 verse 18. Now, it might have even taken on the name the King's Valley because of this battle here. Because of the battle with all the kings, the four kings against the five kings and, and all that took place. It might have even been what gave... Um, the, the area um, that name because it could have just been called Valley of Shava, the Valley of the Plain but to also be called the King's Valley might have started from this battle okay it is 324 I want to try to do Melchizedek real quickly and that's the, the, the note that we'll end on if we race through it too much then when we come back we'll recap and do it but if you can hold on with me I think, I think I can. I think it's too early to quit, and, and I think that I can do, I'm looking at my notes real quick. Yeah, I think I can. Let's go ahead and give it a try. If nothing else, you're going to be left with a cliffhanger, and we'll come back and pick that up. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, the, the battle's been won. He's come back. The king of Sodom has come out to meet him. Uh, because remember, Avram, is, he's not one of the kings. But he fought to get back his, his um, nephew, and he brings back the king's people that they have lost also. He brings back more than just Lot. Okay, so I think we are ready for verse 18. And Melchizedek, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. Okay, we're introduced to this, this person by the name of Melchizedek, which means my king is righteous, or king of righteousness. Melchi is king, and Zadik, Zedek is Aphasadik, which is righteous. It probably was a title for the ancient kings of Salem, um, and it probably derived from an ancient king who ruled his people in righteousness. That's probably how the name developed, if it's meant to be just as a title. But we're going to see some very interesting characteristics about him. 
Uh, he is king or ruler of Salem. Salem was an original name for Jerusalem. I'll explain that more in just a moment. And he's priest of God Most High. Okay, he uniquely king and priest. As we move down in scripture, the kings came through the line of Judah and the priests were in the Levitical line. So this is one, but if you know where I'm headed, you know why he's king and priest here. Being king of Salem, that means he was king of peace or rest. Salem is a form off of the word that we use shalom today. It's, it's that same root that gives us, and we know shalom means peace. The idea behind this Hebrew word is to be full, to be complete, to be perfect. It can have the idea of a restoration in it, but it's, it's a completed. Um, and the first time that King of Salem is identified with Jerusalem in our, um, outside of our Bible, 1400 B.C., archaeology connects those two. But let me take you to Tehillim Psalm 76. And Psalm 76 connects this for us, so we know it's right, not on the basis of history, but on the basis of what God says. Psalm Tehillim 76, sorry, verses 1 and 2 says, God is known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. His tabernacle is in Salem. His dwelling place also is in Zion. And then it goes on from there. So God is known. He's known. The tribe of Judah knows who God is. His name is great in all of Israel. And it's known that his dwelling place is in Zion, a name for Jerusalem. But just before that, his dwelling place, his tabernacle. Where was the tabernacle? Tabernacle, we know when it wasn't out in the, the desert being moved, you know. But it's brought to Jerusalem where the temple, the tabernacle was the, the movable. The temple becomes the permanent in Jerusalem. So in Salem. So you're connecting Jerusalem and Salem. 1400 BC archaeologically. You're connecting it here in Sahalim Psalm 76. And uh, it's it, when I look at the first mention of Jerusalem in scripture. The name Jerusalem means founding or possession. So if we look at it, um, we understand possession more than the word founding. The, the foundation or the possession of peace. And now it's called the city of peace. That that's what the name means. So notice first we have this righteousness. Then we have the peace that follows. First we get introduced to my king is righteous. Then we get introduced to this place, this possession, this foundation of peace. Let me show you how that's a good spiritual um, connotation for us, Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 17, where we read there, and the work of righteousness will be peace, it will be shalom. That's how you get shalom, is by righteous work. Let me take you to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Romans 5 and verse 1. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. When you're justified by faith, you have his righteousness put on you, and that's what gives you peace with God. So we have to have righteousness first. Peace will follow. And that's what's being represented here. Taking it back to Genesis chapter 14. And back to uh, verse, we're in verse 18. Okay, we have the, the um, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He brought out food and drink. He's recognizing, when he's doing this, he's recognizing Avram's nobility and his worth. Uh, the, this one who is a king priest is supplying refreshment and sustenance for a weary warrior and for his men. They haven't been exhausted from the battle. They've just traveled 200 miles, rescued people, brought them back. That wasn't an easy task. And so Melchizedek, Melchizedek comes out with tokens of friendship and hospitality, but we're going to see there's more meaning to it than just that. That's the first level. 
Notice here he is called the priest of God Most High. It's the first time in scripture we have the mention of the word priest. He's the priest, he's the, the servant for the God Most High. In our Hebrew, that's El Elyon. And it's the name of God that declares him to be the founder and the possessor of heaven and earth. That's the name that's being declared. So Melchizedek is saying that he serves the God who is the founder, who is the possessor of heaven and earth. And we have that in the following verse. He, Melchizedek, blessed him and said, Blessed be Avram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Elyon always means the Most High. When God is put with it, and there's at least 28 times in Scripture, 19 of them in the Psalms alone, that uses this expression, we are looking at strength, we're looking at sovereignty, and we're looking at supremacy. God is the most strong, the most sovereign, and the most supreme. And is emphasizing his uniqueness and his supremacy above all others. Remember, there was idol worship around. Avram crossed over. He's worshiping the one true living God. He's worshiping Yehovah, the God who's in intimate relationship with him. This one is El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. He owns it all. And he's almighty. And he is sovereign. And he is controlling it all. And he will sovereignly deliver his children. He will bring them through suffering, through battle, through war, through whatever it is, and he will bring them into a place of eternal refreshment and, um, and, and fulfill all the promises he's given to them. All of this we can see in the picture of what Melchizedek, representing God, did for Abram. That's what we can see. We can be that weary soldier. We can be the one that's gone off and done battle. And the Lord refreshes us and will bring us through in that full victory and finally to home with him where we receive all the promises. But this is the most superlative name you can give God. It's the name that passes all other names. It surpasses them all. It speaks of the majesty of our God. He loves us. He keeps his eye on us. He sees to our needs. And that's why I love that Psalm 91 uses that name. You who dwell in the shadow of El Yom, who abide in the shelter of Shaddai, which means the all-sufficient one, you who have made Adonai, the Lord, your refuge, El Yom, your dwelling place, and then it goes on. When you start thinking that, you know you're under the wing of the protection. You, the, what do you have to fear? This is a great and powerful name, and we should bow down in reverence and honor and thanksgiving, because if God be for us, who could be against us? Dora? Uh, okay, so it says here, he gave him. Does that mean Adam gave, uh, not Adam, but Abram gave Mesedek 10%? Is that the first time? You're ahead. You read oh, ahead. No, you just read it. <laughs> no, I didn't get to that part of the verse. Oh. I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a second question. Okay, and I'll answer both as quick as I can. So when, when did uh, uh, Salem became Jerusalem? Because Salem is, I mean, the word it's, it is in Jerusalem. The, the ancient name and the connection goes all the way back to 1400 B.C. When it actually became just called Jerusalem, um, let me do, let me see if we can find it. I think I've done this before and we don't really know when it just okay. really became, but I will do my best to try to get a better answer than that. Where's my note? So we want Jerusalem versus Salem. Um, yeah, I something tells me I'm not going to be able to get a definitive answer, which, by the way, reminds me also, I came with answers. So I'm seeing the time, and I'm seeing where we are, and I'm going to give us a cliffhanger. I've given you God Most High. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Let me also tell you, we were asked last week, how far from Hebron to Haran, you know, Avram came out of Mesopotamia, stopped in Haran, and then he finally, by the time he stops and settles, he's in Hebron, which is down south in, in Israel. That's about 3,300 miles. Um, is that the right one? There were so many variants on this. Um, that's where, okay, Ur the Chaldees to Haran was about 600 miles. Okay, so... From when he left Ur and he stopped in Iran, he'd gone about 600 miles. 
Then Haran to Shechem in the north was 400. Shechem to Bethel is 20. Bethel down to Egypt is 225. No, it's about 1,300 miles that you get from these two. That's right. When I came up with that 3,300, that was um, a different Haran. It wasn't, it wasn't our, it's the one we're talking about. So it's roughly, I'm going to say, roughly 1,300, 1,400 miles that he's traveled. Um, to get down to Hebron from when he left Ur. It could be a little bit more than that, but that gives you a round figure because that was asked last week. From Canaan to Mesopotamia is 400 miles. Then from Ur the Chaldees to Haran is 600 miles. So, does that help? Okay, okay. Sorry, I forgot to bring that out at the beginning of class today, but I wanted it on here because it was asked in the last class. And what I'm going to do is leave us with this, where we're going to continue the, the discussion next week as to who Melchizedek really is, and I'll bring back, and I don't mean next week, because next week's Thanksgiving, and then we have one more week off, so December 6th or whatever it is, the first um, Wednesday in December, we'll pick back up. I can't believe we're talking December. Anyway, um, we'll pick back up and discuss the, all the spiritual meaning of Melchizedek. I will let you know he is typology. There is a picture here. It's a very rich picture. I've started to delve into it when they've gotten into the bread and the wine. But take it, work on it, see what you come up with. Um, let's see what we can, we'll come back to what El Yong means. But it's also very interesting because this is the name that the Gentiles knew God by. What do I mean by that? How did they know? And I don't mean that they knew like we know. So I'll show you some scriptures that are interesting with that name. We'll talk about who Melchizedek is. I'll tip my hand this far and let you know. Some believe that he's an actual human being. Some believe he was a theophany or a Christophany, a picture of the Lord. Look at your scriptures. See what you see. Come up with your choice of which you think is right. I'll give you answers at the end, but I'll warn you. I'm not going to give you a, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> so we'll look at it, though, and we'll decide. We may decide that everybody might choose the same, and there might be some who choose a different view. But we'll look at why we think what we think, what Scripture does tell us, and be as conclusive on it as we can. But it's wonderful to stop and just cap on this name. What a place to end. As we go into our time of thanksgiving, as we should always every day be thankful, when I realize the supremacy of this God, I realize how powerful he is, how majestic he is. When I read to you his strength, his sovereignty, his supremacy, he's unique above all others. Nothing comes near. He possesses it all. He didn't need me. <laughs> and, and, and he's so, you could think he's so busy keeping it all in control and working this master plan through thousands of ages. But when I catch just a glimpse of that and feel like, you know, a piece of lint on a, a rug that you're trying to see thousands of miles away. <laughs> and yet, I see that one supreme in my life, sovereign in my life, work in the details of my life, rescue me in my life, send someone at the right moment, do something that is just so awesome and amazing, you know it's the hand of God. If that doesn't make your heart just <laughs> explode and rejoice and praise Him and thank Him, he did, he, he, He's just everything and we are nothing. And yet he picks up this nothing and says, I love you. And I love you so much, I'll die for you. And I love you so much, I'll raise from the dead and I'll live for you. And I love you so much that I'll be in every second of your life. You'll never know separation. Nothing can separate you from my love. When you begin to grasp that, just let your praise cry out. El Elyon, Most High God and praise him and thank you. He brought about the United States. I don't care what side you're on politically and I don't care whether we're in a good place or a bad place. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about a country 
that allows Rochelle to teach the Word of God, that allows you to zoom in and hear the Word of God. We have so much to be thankful for. Let's not be like the children of Israel, known for gripe, 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 gripe. Let's be known for praise, 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 and praise some more. So on that note, we'll close with a word of thanksgiving, a word of praise to our God, the same God who met Abram here, the same God who we read all the way through scriptures is the same God in 2022. What are we on? November 16th, 2022. Is that not awesome and amazing in itself? And I haven't begun to say anything worthy of my God. Let's pray. El Elyon, our Most High God, we do praise and thank you that you are God Most High, that you are sitting on your throne in full control, that you are mastermind. And Lord, we do want to just lift up praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that we can bring requests, that you tell us come and cry our hearts out to you. You tell us to stand in the gap and pray for others. And we thank you that, that we have all that. We thank you for the country that allows us the freedom. And we know there are those literally suffering for your name right now in other countries that are not given that freedom. Lord, let us be so thankful as we enter into a, a, a time on the counter that reminds us, Lord, let it be our habit day in and day out. Let your praises be on our lips morning, noon, and night. Let it be that we bring you glory, that we honor you, that we are a sweet-smelling savor because we are bringing up your praises, you who are worthy of all. Thank you for being supreme. Thank you for being sovereign. Thank you for being God most high. And thank you for bending down to this earth to pick up when is I. Unworthy, nothing worth it, and yet you found love in your heart, God, to rescue, to save. And, and I know everyone within my hearing is agreeing, Lord, we just praise you and we thank you for being our Savior, for loving us, for caring for us. And we just want to give you praise forever and ever and ever. Thank you for the time you will take us home. We will be in your presence and we will get to sing your praises forever. But hear them now and be pleased, Lord, as we give you the glory and the honor. Do your holy name, El Elio, God Most High. Praise you, thank you, hallelujah, in Yeshua Jesus' name, amen. Blessed Thanksgiving to one and all. What a note to end on. El Elio, it's going to be the name I'm going to work on for a while. Anytime you touch the name of God, it becomes amazing. Look out, see how he shows it to you in his life. Open up the mics and let, let the praise.